everyone. Thanks very much indeed. Um, I expect that a few weeks from now, quite a lot of you are going to be sitting down with family and friends and eating a Thanksgiving meal. Could I have hands up if people are not planning to do that? Okay, that's everyone. <laughs> now, this fascinates me. Um, because when we sit down to enjoy Thanksgiving, or I should say when you do, because we don't do this in England, uh, something very interesting is happening. As an entire nation, you're sharing a meal on the same day, and you may be giving thanks like this family here, or you may just simply be celebrating. But you're doing something very, very profound. You're actually triggering a behavior, an activity that really is about as fundamental as it gets in terms of us, who we are, and how we relate to one another, which is thinking about food and where it comes from and actually giving thanks for the fact that you've got food at all. It's ancient, it's extraordinary, and I think what I'm hoping to sort of give you in the very short space of time that I've got is this idea that actually food it's so fundamental to us that we can't see it. It's actually too big to see. But if we can learn to see it and to understand how profoundly it shapes our lives, it's transformative. Now, as I say, this is an ancient activity. Uh, here is uh, an illustration of Thanksgiving going on roughly four and a half thousand years ago. Um, it happens to be going on in a city called Ur, and that's significant too, because what's actually been given thanks for in this image uh, is this stuff, grain. Now, I think it's fair to say that none of us would actually be here if it weren't for grain. I don't know about you, but I had a bagel uh, with some very delicious cream cheese and, um, and a croissant for breakfast this morning. Did anybody here not eat something that had grain in it for breakfast this morning? Amazing. One person, but you're not quite sure. Um, I mean... <laughs> This stuff, the discovery of grain as a source of food, is what made cities possible. And therefore, what made the kind of civilization that allows a group of a couple of hundred of us to be in a room today discussing ideas possible. Why? Because if we go back roughly 10,000 years or so, it was the discovery of grain as a food source that allowed large populations of non-hunting, non-berry-gathering people to gather. Uh, this is an area of the ancient Near East called the Fertile Crescent, so-called because that crescent-shaped band was where the ancient antecedents of modern wheat and barley were first found. And people began experimenting with this radical new food source because prior to that, people had uh, hunted and gathered, as I'm sure you know. But, of course, it meant that they were traveling around after their food rather than waiting in one place uh, and waiting for the harvest and then basically sort of gathering it in and storing it and redistributing it. So that if we look at one of these really early farming settlements that grew into cities, uh, we can see a structure which essentially shows... Um, uh, a, a kind of very intense urban core surrounded by farmland on a river. And if you look at the, the large building in the middle, the temple, uh, that's actually where the grain for the harvest was brought in, celebrated, offered to the gods, and then redistributed back to the people during the course of the year. Now, I'm really <laughs> doing an impossible thing here because I'm trying to sort of sketch in kind of 5,000 years of urban civilization in 18 minutes, which is insane. Um, but nevertheless, if, if you can sort of get the idea from what I'm trying to tell you very, very quickly, uh, that grain is the only food we've ever discovered capable of feeding urban populations uh, because it's static and you can get a food surplus that you can store. That allowed cities to grow. But the earlier cities, like her, were very small and very compact. They were also on rivers because rivers allowed the food to be transported easily. These are just all very, very basic facts that I'm just sketching in. Of course, it's a lot more complicated than that, really. Now, if we look at these early cities, what's interesting is that the importance of food and the centrality of the harvest was absolutely fundamental to the way people understood what a city was. If you look at this very famous public space, uh, the Athenian Agora, uh, that, in fact, was Athens' food market. But if you look at this one, um, I want to press a laser here, but I'm not sure that I'm going to sort of set the building on fire if I do, so I, I won't bother. But if you look... Um, 
over there, <laughs> essentially, you can see there's one round building. And this is a very significant building in the Agora because it's actually a public dining room. And what happened was that the first citizens in, in the first democracy on Earth who uh, were sort of running the country on behalf of their citizens would sit in this building and have a meal together which was symbolic that the democracy was functioning well. Now, a Greek meal 4,000 years ago or whatever was very similar to a Greek meal today, and I'm sure many of you have had a meal like this, where you sit down and there's a lot of dishes in the middle of the table, uh, and you get your piece of bread, and you dip the bread and into the sort of the tar of salata or the hummus or whatever, and you eat it. Now, what's interesting, have, have most of you eaten a Greek meal at one point or another? Has anyone not? You're a fabulous audience, because, <laughs> okay, try it, it's good, good stuff. Um, but, <laughs> but the fascinating thing about this is that in ancient Greece, um, greed at table was taken to be a sign of profound untrustworthiness. And in fact, if you took too much of the, the yummy dips, which are called opson, uh, which were expensive and obviously the interesting part of the meal, um, and piled it on your sitos, which is a Greek name for bread and indeed a general name for food, you were deemed to be greedy and therefore untrustworthy. So basically, table manners had a direct link on whether you would succeed as a politician in ancient, Ashen, ancient Athens or not. Now, this profound understanding is something that, interestingly, is still in our sort of the backs of our brains. In fact, we're wired up to trust people who eat the same food as us and to distrust people that don't eat the same. And certainly, I'm sure any of you, if you were sitting down and somebody kind of reached across and, you know, grabbed your last delicious-looking potato chip and ate it before you, you wouldn't think very well of them. So these things are still there in our culture. They're just kind of buried and we don't really think about them very much. But as this wonderful image from Siena in the 14th century shows you, in previous times, the relationship between the city and its productive hinterland from where the food was coming was very much uppermost. So the allegory of the effects of good government in this incredible picture, which actually sits on one wall in the Sienese town hall, uh, tells you everything you need to know about the importance of food in the psychology of the people running Siena in the 14th century. And you can see huntsmen leaving the city to go and shoot a boar for dinner. You can see asses with grain on their backs coming into the city. This is a fundamental picture about the symbiotic relationship between a city and its hinterland, which is very, very important and always has been and indeed still is, although we think about it a lot less today. Now, of course, today that relationship looks a lot more like this. In other words, uh, yes, we still have cities and we still have productive hinterlands, but we're not as aware of the connection. We can't just look out of the window and see where our food is coming from. In Chicago, probably in more cities, you are aware of uh, your food history because you are an incredibly important city in terms of the history of food. But globally, uh, cities, for instance, in China who can't feed themselves are importing food from all over the world. So we've got an incredible paradox. I call it a paradox, which is that the more we move into cities, in order to celebrate this wonderful thing called urban civilization, in other words, the ability to be with one another, we get further and further away from our sources of sustenance. And there is no ideal solution to this, but really struggling with how to solve this problem is probably the greatest practical problem that we face as human beings. And of course, it's getting much more acute as the world urbanizes. Now, the interesting thing is that previously, the one thing that used to limit the size to which a city could grow was its ability to feed itself, and cities were very often put on rivers for a reason, as I said earlier, not only because it allowed the food to be transported, but it also brought sustenance into the city. Now, that all changed with the invention of this thing, the railway, and of course, the railway is absolutely fundamental to Chicago's history as well, because this allowed for the first time for food to be transported long distances very, very quickly, which you like, uh, uh, emancipated cities from geography, meant that cities could actually, for the first time ever, grow to any size, any place, anywhere, effectively. And if we look at the growth of London immediately after the invention of the railway, we can see a, a small, compact city, as most cities were, on the left, transforming into a vast metropolitan blob, technical term for somewhere, that you couldn't just walk to the centre of the city and get your food, but actually the food would have had to have been brought in by railway and obviously subsequently also by motor car. 
Now, this, of course, is where Chicago really comes in, because Chicago took over the mantle of Paul Coppolis from Cincinnati for the simple reason that it was linked up to the railway uh, and therefore was able to bring grain, the food of cities, in very efficiently and then get them out either to the East Coast or then to other parts of the world. There was such a grain surplus, in fact, because the Midwest, the, the plains of the Midwest were opened up and able to bring the grain in by railway uh, that people didn't really know what to do with it anymore. And so instead of eating it directly, as had always been the case historically, it began to be fed to animals, and then the animals were fed to the city. So this is the beginning of meatpacking. This is what made Chicago great. But it also is a sort of warp in the kind of historical line of the feeding of cities, because instead of predominantly living directly on grain, we now live on grain that's gone through an animal first, and it takes about 10 times as much grain to feed us, if that's the case. So it's enormous implications, this way of feeding us has. Not only that, but as people began to become more dispersed and more sort of distanced from their source of food, they began to distrust it. And I'm sure many of you know the famous book, The Jungle, written by Upton Sinclair, about the terrible conditions that used to take place in the stockyards and both animals and humans, a lot of suffering going on in order to produce cheap meat. And there was a great revulsion against eating uh, ground meat particularly, which the uh, very, very aptly named White Castle chain of hamburger joints kind of solved the problem by sort of having this white, clean, sort of trustable-looking building, saying, actually, no, really, it is okay to eat meat. Um, and it's, it's, if you think about this, how successful this, this formula for feeding us has become, it's gone global. Um, and there are massive implications for this. It's, it's the lowest common denominator food. There's an absolutely fascinating book if you want to know more about how it evolved. But basically, it's a food that doesn't disgust anyone because actually salt, sugar, and fat, the three main flavor ingredients, plus yummy meat, uh, is, is something that we all, you know, as I say, those atavistic parts of our brain can't help but respond to. But this is actually a cat catastrophe in terms of uh, global resources and also in terms of global health. Um, soil degradation, climate change, huge amounts of uh, fresh water going into this way of feeding ourselves, and a transition from eating grain to meat, as I say, that is going through animals first. And we're actually burning up 10 calories of energy for every calorie of food we're producing in this way of feeding ourselves. And 1.4 million farm workers a week are leaving rural areas to go into cities because industrialization is actually removing them from the land. It's taking their jobs away. And of course, this question of are we feeding the world, as I say, we have a billion hungry, a billion obese, and those numbers are rising all the time, and yet we waste up to half of the food that we produce because we don't value food, because we've externalized the true costs. So the question is, what are we going to do about it? And as I said, that's not a new question. In fact, for as long as people have been building cities, they've been realizing it's quite difficult to feed them and saying, how are we going to do it better? Plato, who lived in Athens, understood the true value of food, said we have to limit the size to which cities can grow, and then if it gets too big, it can't sustain itself. We have to go and found one somewhere else. And this is a, a theme that runs all the way through utopian thought. Thomas More's Utopia, indeed, was a network of semi-independent city-states linked to one another uh, but about a day's walk away, and Ebenezer Howard's very famous model, The Garden Cities of Tomorrow, is basically Thomas More's utopia with railways. The idea being that you're living in a sort of dense pocket of urbanity, close to farmland, but you're close enough to other people via a network uh, that you can basically still get, for instance, a symphony orchestra together, you know, the fruits of civilization. Now, these are utopian thinkers, as indeed are vertical farms, uh, which you know, says, let's bring food production back into the city again and put them in large towers. Although, you know, if you work out how many you'd actually need to feed Chicago, even if you could imagine sort of re replacing sunlight and soil and so on, um, the jury's out on that one. It's still utopian thought. In fact, you can't feed a city from within a city and that, in fact, is the whole point about the word utopia. It either means a good place or no place. 
Um, so my thinking is that actually, since food shapes all of our lives anyway, why don't we come up with a new word? I call it sitopia, which simply means food place, because actually I think we, our homes, our families, our buildings, our society, and indeed the cities and the landscapes that feed them are all shaped by food. So if we think about food as a transformative tool, it can be incredibly powerful for making change that is not complete change, in other words, utopian, but it's incremental. It can work towards utopia. We have to think of food as a flow. It flows from the land, through distribution systems, into markets, into kitchens, into our lives, our homes, restaurants, and back into the system again. But it's far more complicated than that because every single link in that chain is profoundly linked to every other by habits, beliefs, customs, preferences, my granny did it differently, and so on. Food culture is the shorthand for understanding how complex this thing is we're talking about. In fact, culture is really what we're talking about. And if you look at all of these incredible pictures from the wonderful book, Hungry Planet, I recommend you go and have a look at it, you can extrapolate whether you, know, you have cows that are eating grass, uh, as indeed cows evolved to do, or whether they're in CAFOs, huge concentrated animal feeding operations where there's 160,000 cows wandering around in their old poo, eating grain that we could be eating, whether we have social capital, whether we actually go into spaces where there are other, other humans in order to buy our food, or whether in the name of efficiency we remove the human from the food chain and just get it all sort of you know, food logistics just kind of endlessly happening without us engaging in it at all, whether there's a phrase in English called knowing your onions, meaning people that can look at raw vegetables and understand what to do with them. They don't have to be women, by the way, or to wear funny clothes. Um, but, you know, just the idea that you can look at food and know what it is, know what to do with it. One third of meals in the UK, I'm speeding up because I'm really running out of time, um, are cooked like this very cheerful looking gentleman on the, uh, your right hand side uh, because Basically, we don't cook for ourselves anymore. How do we eat? Now, I mean, this extraordinary statistic I found uh, that one in five meals or 90% of meals in America is eaten in a car now. Now, what does this tell you about society, given everything I've been saying in this very short talk that's fast running out of time, about the importance of eating together and how this is how we evolved as humans? This is how we socialize. This is how we civilize. It's a real issue. And of course, whether we waste food, I already mentioned that. Do we value food enough to close the loop or do we just chuck it away? On the right-hand side there was all that fruit was from a supermarket dumpster, by the way. The true value of food is only visible when there's a crisis, when there's a war, uh, or for instance in Havana in Cuba when the Soviet Union collapsed, or of course in Detroit when the car industry moved away people actually go immediately back to growing food because you have to. And then you understand the real value of food, the most important thing in all our lives. Now, my view, and it's very, very uh, sort of straightforward, actually, is we have to learn to value food again. We have to understand how important it is to us. We have to understand what it means to us that it is the center of life. Bring people back into it. So community-supported agriculture, food co-ops like uh, this is Park Slope, a fantastic food co-op uh, in Brooklyn and New York, or actually urban farming. I'm not against vertical farming per se. I just believe it needs to be what I would call sitopian, in other words, appropriate in scale. This is actually City Farms in Chicago at the bottom. Ben Flanner, a fantastic New York urban farmer at the top. It's about neo-geography. It's recognizing the importance of geography again. That's a project on the left, which is basically in the Netherlands, trying to bring uh, sort of incremental food production back into urban development. And Robert Lavalva in New York trying to revive wholesale markets in the city. There are many, many ideas out there. Lab meat, permaculture, plant paradise, where you grow plants under fairy lights, um, which are trying to sort of work out how to feed the world. That, to me, is the wrong question. The question has to be, what kind of world are we trying to feed and how do we use food and our value of food and the way we eat to get there? It's about seeing through food. That's how you do it. Just grab a pair of these imaginary glasses and stick them in front of your face and we can change the world. Thank you so much.